Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. Returning guest on the program with us today is Keith Newmeyer, and this is a perfect day to talk to Keith. Uh, just for everybody listening, it's May 19th, and it seems like a breakout for silver is here, and who better to talk to than the head of First Majestic Silver, Keith Newmeyer? Welcome back to the program. Well, thanks, Colin. It's uh, great to hear hear your voice again. And uh, you're right, it's a fantastic day. We've had uh, two back-to-back days uh, when silver is outperforming gold. Yeah, it sure is nice and hopefully a sign of things to come. You know, what's most shocking is looking at the silver stocks and you can look at First Majestic, for an ex- for example, up considerably. And that's in light of silver not moving that much. I mean, the silver to gold ratio is still way out of whack and silver is nowhere close to where it was uh, back in 2011. So it seems like the sky's the limit on this one. Well, I think it was really the ratio that woke a lot of the big money up. You know, when the ratio broke through 100 which in itself was unprecedented and, you know, gone all the way up to, I think, north of even 120. I didn't, I didn't do the calculation today, but probably in the 110 range there about approximately. But, you know, these are unprecedented ratios, you know, comparing the price of silver and the price of gold. And, and our phones were ringing off the hook, you know, literally for a month now about, you know, people looking, uh, kicking the tires and, and big money, like big institutions, which is really interesting because, we haven't seen, you know, the big generalists coming to the table for quite some time, and they're now finally coming back to the table. Keith, it seems like the setup, uh, just looking at the overall economy, uh, obviously this has been sparked by the, the COVID virus, but all of these issues were already in place. The setup just seems perfect for precious metals, and if it's perfect for precious metals, of course, you know, silver, one would think, is going to benefit even more than gold. Talk to us about, you know, just what you're seeing, uh, you know, in terms of the Fed policy and, you know, if it confirms kind of what you've been looking at for the past few years. Yeah, well, look, there's a direct correlation. I think um, it's a, there's about a 90 percent correlation between um, interest rates. I mean, real interest rates, so not just actual you know, interest rates, but real interest rates, inflation um including in that number and it's its relationship with the gold prices and we're going where we're already in but it's going to get worse you know we're, we're going to see interest rates go much lower well it's hard to even imagine much lower interest rates when you're trading you know already at you know one or two percent depending on which uh, term you're looking at them in themselves are are historically low but the talk is negative interest rates uh, trump has said he wants it the Europeans just started talking about it again last week. It's one of these taboo discussions that no one wants to admit is going to happen. But um, you know, I think inter- in, uh, negative interest rates are in the in the cards in the United States, which is going to have all kinds of other ramifications, which you know we don't e- even have time today to address. And and quite honestly, no one's really experienced it anyway, so we can speculate all we want. But one thing we do know is that as interest rates go lower. Gold goes higher. Yeah, that's a great point. And I'm going to put you on the spot here a bit. You know, it, it's my feeling that gold could easily go to three to five thousand dollars. And I've heard some people quote numbers far, far higher than that. At some point, it doesn't really matter. But if gold does go to that level, what is your thought on where silver could potentially go? Well, you know, the trade, the uh, trading rate, ratio and the mining ratio are unfortunately quite different numbers. You know, I'm a big supply demand fundamentalist, and uh, I believe that anything should trade on its true supply demand fundamentals. Obviously, we've not been proven correct in the case of silver, but as a mining industry, you know, of which I run the, the more well-known producing mining companies, First Majestic Silver, we, as a global industry, produce for every one ounce of gold being mined, only eight ounces of silver. So, you know, how do you trade at eight ounces of silver when, or mine eight ounces of silver when you're trading at something north of 100 ounces uh, per um, of, of silver on the ratio basis? So, anyways, I, I just find, look, it got down to 31 in 2011 when silver hit 50 bucks. I'm sure we're going to see those types of ratios again, and and I would suggest that we would even see a much lower ratio. I'm not sure if we're ever going to see eight to one, but we should. But uh, that's another conversation as well altogether. You know, it's, it's, uh, we see twenty, twenty-five, thirty to one, five thousand dollar gold. 
looking at um, you know triple digits over. Keith, I'm sure you were hearing some similar commentary to what I was catching back a couple months ago. Obviously, fear was at its peak and there was blood running in the streets. Uh, I heard certain precious metals analysts making claims that uh, you know gold might be okay, but I think silver's decoupled, it's dead, it's industrial, it's not going to have the investment demand. And of course, that happened to coincide right when that ratio hit kind of one to 120, like you said, unprecedented. Were you catching similar comments from people as well? Well, I put first and Jensen together 18 years ago. So, you know, it's not the first time that comment has come to, uh, you know, the, the marketplace. And uh, human beings always look backwards and see, you know, they're trying to look for cause and effect. And, and yeah, for sure, you know, silver is precious metal, without a doubt, but it's also an industrial metal. I even take it one step further. I, I call silver a strategic metal. And people have heard me uh, say that I've been saying it for um, over four or five years now. And I've heard other people call it the same. So why I say that is because everything that, that we do as a human race, you know, we want silver. Well, we need silver. You know, there's this call that we're having right now would not be possible without silver. You know, all the gadgets that we use every day, you know, automobiles, you know, our transportation systems, our, you know, aircraft, televisions, uh, everything. From the moment, actually, even during our sleeping hours, you know, silver is operating in the background in some way, shape, or form. And uh, so it's a very strategic metal without silver and copper, quite honestly, but without silver, our lives would change for the worst, um, quite dramatically so. And it hasn't really been picked up by the marketplace. You know, we saw a couple of years ago, we saw cobalt take off. We've seen uh, you know, other metals like, you know, our uranium a few years ago. And, you know, more recently, we've seen, you know, palladium uh, take off as well. And these are caused by all of a sudden major retail demand coming into a specific marketplace because all these markets are extremely tight. And uh, I don't think investors quite honestly understand how tight these markets are. And silver has been in a deficit going back 30 years. And not every year it's been in a deficit, but there's then there's been several years over that 30 years that the metal has actually dropped into a deficit uh, situation. And um, as we want to go green as the human race and, you know, as we get off oil and gas and as we do, you know, all the things that uh, we're doing to electrify the planet in, in much more green ways, we're going to need a lot more silver. And at 17 bucks silver, which is where it's at today, which is, you know, obviously very nice to see compared to what it was just a couple of months ago, we're not going to produce a, enough silver to meet the needs of the human race. And we need multi digits, uh, you know, three, four, five times, 10 times what the current metal price is trading at to make it economic enough to get the silver into industry to, to change the way we do things from an electrification standpoint of view. Keith, investors do seem, as you just pointed out, to cling to their most recent experiences. And for gold and silver investors, that is 2016 in a way. In 2016, we had the beginning of what seemed like a rip-roaring bull market in these mining stocks. First Majestic, for example, performed incredibly well during that time, and many other mining stocks did well. Do you feel like this time around, the circumstances are more akin to, uh, say, the move that started in 08 or even 2001, which had, of course, much more longevity to them? Well, that 2016 trade was quite a different animal. We we're coming out of uh, 2015 where things were not so great in the economy. And there was a view that we're going to get back into this inflationary mode globally from an economic perspective. And there was a bid that came in to the mining sector, copper, you know, all the silver, gold, you know, everything was bid up. And it was just simply for the fact that people thought we're going to go back to 2010, 2011, 2012, where we had a, quite a rip-roaring economy after the big depression back in 08, 09. So, no, I don't think that 2016 can be comparable. You know, I look at this as more comparable to 1929 to 1933. You know, in 29, we had major crash over the next year into, into 1930. We had a pretty aggressive rally that lasted about six months, very similar to the rally that we've had in the U.S. marketplace. And interestingly, you know, if, if people outside the U.S. would look at what's going on in the international markets, they're not doing the same thing that the U.S. market is doing. So a lot of FOMO going on in the U.S. space. I was trying to catch the bottom. Where's the bottom? I hear 
more people saying that is the bottom in, you know, I think the bottom's in, you know, we're, we're, we're back to the races again and, and so on and so forth. But in my view, that's not the case. I think we're going to take, a, you know, probably a two to three year dip here that's, uh, you know, could, we, we could see 30, 40, 50 percent erased from the major markets uh, in the U.S. Uh, it's already happened in most everywhere else in the world. You look at the Asian markets or the European stock indexes, you know, they're all down quite dramatically. It's just, you know, U.S. seems to be just this unusual phenomenon whereby there's a direct relationship between how much money the Fed prints and, and the stock market. And then, of course, you know, the whole thing is related to tax collection and, 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 and trade and so on and so forth. But I think this market is going to have some challenges and uh, that's going to be great for the gold sector with the constant or continuous money printing uh, that we're seeing and, and the lowering interest rates. Uh, it's a fantastic, it's almost, you know, everything's coming together for us to, uh, you know, waiting for the things that we've been talking about for close to, you know, seven or eight years are all happening right now in front of our eyes. And, uh, you know, you mentioned 5,000 hour gold. Well, you know, I don't know where gold's going to end up. It could be three, it could be five. Uh, silver could be 100, 150, who knows, but there's a lot of money to be made in this current environment, and uh, this could last easily three to five years. You are a uh, prolific marketer, in my opinion, on your ability to get as many people exposed to the silver story in First Majestic. And I use this anecdote. I was speaking, uh, we get Rick Rule on the, on the radio show here often, and he will request that people send in their junior mining portfolio for him to give a review. I don't remember what the percentage was, but by far and away, more accounts held First Majestic silver than any other mining stock out there. Um, but that's really an anomaly. And if you look at how many people, how many investors actually own mining stocks in general, there's nobody in the trade at this point. I, I, the Robinhood platform, which puts this information out, there's only something like 24,000 out of 10 million accounts as of last week that own Barrick Gold, the biggest gold stock out there. So it seems like there's a huge amount of information or education, I should say, that needs to be given to the investment community and a big trade left to happen. A lot of people still to jump in. Yeah, you know, look, I've, I've been in this industry or this market for 35 years and, and uh, seen it. You know, I, I, you know, I understand crowds. I understand human behavior, greed and, and, and all those issues. And it's just the way we are. And I'm not sure if we're ever going to change that. But, you know, unfortunately, people have to wake up and realize that the mining sector is very cyclical and it goes through long periods of excitement and, and uh, also long periods of uh, bear markets that you know can can destroy portfolios. The, the way I personally do things is I, I love buying stuff on sale. I love buying stuff when no one wants it. And I, I look personally for distressed assets and uh, companies that are having challenges. And, and uh, obviously they have to have good assets, but they could have all kinds of other problems that, um, you know, maybe I, I or my team can come in and, and maybe rectify and, and turn things around. And uh, that's where I've made most of my money. And you know, I don't like to chase the market. And, and uh, but I'm at the same time, you have to be prepared to be wrong. And that's something people generally investors generally don't like to be, you know, and when I when I decide after a few months of due diligence on looking at a particular investment in the mining space, and I finally decide, okay, I'm going to start taking a position in it. I automatically expect to own it between three to five years. And I, I expect automatically to be wrong. If I'm wrong, down, if I'm down 50% on my position, that's okay to me because that means I could just buy a lot more. So I always scale things in. I always scale things out. If you, you know, want to buy 10,000 shares in a particular stock that you really like, do do it in five transactions over a period of six months, and and scale scale things back, you know, ten percent, you know, per per order, and just see what happens. And you know, quite quite interestingly enough, you end up getting filled a lot of times, and you end up owning that ten thousand shares at a pretty good average cost. And you know, when things do turn around, all of a sudden, you know, you you, you make a hundred percent or two hundred percent on your on your investment just because you're patient. 
Keith, I'm going to leave you with one last question. A lot of people know you today as uh, a silver guy, if you will, obviously first Majestic Silver, uh, but in the past founded first Quantum Copper, now the fifth or sixth largest primary copper producer, and you also have first Mining Finance, which is a gold-focused vehicle. My question is this, uh, do you think precious metals are really the only place to be the next few years, or do you think that commodities in general are going to benefit off of uh, Fed policy and just where the general equities are going? Yeah, look, that's a pretty broad question. Um, you know, I, I am the chairman of First Mining Gold, which has a portfolio of really exciting gold assets in eastern Ontario, which is trading trading at super cheap numbers, which I think people should look at. Uh, you know, I, my only high tech investment is is a company called Nano One, which is a, a battery uh, company, which I'm, I've been a shareholder of for geez, I don't know, five, six, seven years now, and then pretty exciting what they're doing but the stock has just been going kind of sideways um but you know most of my portfolio is in in gold and silver or silver and gold um uh, you know silver one's a big investment of mine of course my core core investments you know being first majestic and first mining i, I think that uh, we're in a, a long bull market here this is the time to be owning stuff I, you know i would be avoiding the major markets you know that i i've got nothing against the the big companies, but you know, it's this comes down to flows of capital, and and the mining sector is extremely tiny. Uh, you look at the silver sector, for example. If you look at the total mining production of somewhere around 800 million ounces of silver produced annually, $17 silver, you know, works out to what 16 billion dollars of silver gets uh, produced annually. You know, how many times can that fit into Apple's market cap, for example? It's just, it's just absolutely ridiculous how small the mining sector is. So if you time your investments correctly in the mining sector, you can do extremely well because all that capital that was into the big stocks, you know, even a small portion of that capital starts to come into the mining sector. And that's where, as you mentioned earlier in 2016, where you can get you know, three, four or five hundred percent gains in, 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 in this sector just because it's just a supply demand. There's only a limited amount of stock outstanding on First Majestic or any of the companies I own in my portfolio. So they, of course, they could issue more and they can do financings, all of that. But uh, generally speaking, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you, you increase the demand in a particular mining stock by 10 times. You know, what's what's going to happen to that stock? That's what's going to happen. Well, it's already starting to happen. And it's just, you know, the question is, how long is it going to last? You know, is this a six-year blip like like what happened in 26 or a six-month blip, which happened in 2016? Or is this uh, something a lot more sustainable that's going to go, you know, three, four, five, or even maybe longer? My bet is that this is going to be a longer bull run, likely matching the one that went from 2002 to 2012, the 10-year run we had on the miners, I think this is going to be something similar to that. And it all comes down to just money printing and interest rates. You know, the, the governments are absolutely, as your listeners know, as you you, you know yourself, Colin, you know, the, the, the governments here are intent on trying to float this economy with free money. And free money always uh, translates into higher gold prices. Well, Keith, congratulations oh, on uh, the beginning of this this move. I think it has a, a lot, lot longer to go, as as obviously you do for silver. And you know, congrats on the the validation. You've been uh, a huge proponent of silver, and I, I think it's going to be an incredible, incredible place to be uh, for the next few years. Thanks for coming back on the program and chatting with our listeners, and look forward to getting you back here sometime soon. Yeah, and one day hopefully we can actually uh, see each other face to face. I went to a restaurant last night for the first time in two months. Uh, they opened up, and uh, we were one of their first customers, and it was uh, quite an interesting experience being back in restaurants. And uh, I'm looking forward to doing more and more of that. Yeah, well, I envy you. I have not been to a restaurant for two and a half, three months now. It's certainly strange. Yes, it is. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need 
copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?